Hello everyone, today we talk about the 3rd century crisis and the first consistent settlement of Germanic and other barbarian elements within the Roman uh, borders. We can't speak of such a thing, by the way. As we will see now, uh, this is not really the beginning of uh, a Roman settlement of foreign elements within the Rome frontiers, but uh, uh, it is the first moment in which this starts taking... Um, f first of all, it, it will not be stopped um, till the dissolution of the empire in the West, and secondly, in through dynamics that are that are somewhat different, uh, both quantitatively and properly, you know, contextually, to the ones of the previous centuries. So we never, I think, made a video about the third century crisis per se. We talked about Gallienus' army, the Roman uh, reforms of the third century, um, and generally speaking, the reorganization of the statal and, and military. Uh, organization of the Roman Empire in the period, we were never even really talked too much about the uh, barbarian invasions of this phase, nor about the Illyrian emperors or other things. So, um, you know that we don't cover as much Roman history as the medieval ones. In fact, this is part, broadly speaking, of a of, of the medieval history series today. But um, we will come back hopefully on those topics again and expanding them and even talking about things that we didn't address um, before. Um, so what we're witnessing with the third century crisis and this moment in which the Roman Empire could effectively crumble, right? This this is not an exaggeration. Uh, it would have not been strange cons considering other examples in history, but this is also what makes it all the more extraordinary, telling the truth, and that shows how robust the uh, foundations of the empire really were, and how much moral and material strength this system had to re literally reunite, re-stabilize the whole thing. Naturally, with important changes, that we will see partly, you know, you know, the, for the, the further autocratization, monarchization of the empire, the, 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 the structural damage that the system suffered, mostly not just because of the barbarian invasions, they were just one part of the story, but actually the Roman civil wars that were actually much more disrupted um, for, the, for the Roman system altogether than the external ones. And, and this is, in fact, how, in fact, the, the barbarian invasions, the migration era should be framed on more, more realistically. And this is at least what the most updated historiography has underlined abundantly. That when we talk about, f first of all, there is not really a, an opposition between the barbaricum um, and the barbaritas per se um, to Rome as such. Uh, the, these peoples lived fundamentally in a Roman sphere of influence that had been a stabilizing force, telling the truth, uh, for a further development of the same populations that when we see starting from the second half of, of the second century and the third start uh, coalescing, conglomerating in in confederacies, right, uh, of uh, more, you know, robust nature that um, than the, the the previous tribes, right? Confederacies had kind of always existed. Think about the Swabians that were there since Caesar's time. So they had been, and they had been active already at that point. But let's say the arrival of the Romans at uh, in Gaul, uh, along the Alpine, the, the the Danubian areas, had stamped these movements. These peoples were still somewhat kind of primitive. Their their resources were um, were stable at that point, at least in the mechanisms, in political social mechanisms of uh, competition also between each other. It's just, in fact, from the mid-2nd century AD that things start changing in a more worrying way. Something cracked in Germany, in, in, in the German political balance, also um, internationally trade uh, kind of was, was disrupted. The Germans began to to search for new opportunities somewhere else and they have there is just the empire fundamentally because those are the uh, the developed areas east and north there there is fundamentally uh, anything 
uh, or, or, or almost. And um, in any case, the Roman control over the major uh, trade routes, whether land or maritime ones, is what what these peoples aim at. Because again, they they have to move for something better, not for, for something worse. And so attritions began. There are the Marcomannic Wars. There are other. There is um, uh, an increase in the instability of, of the frontier. As always, the Romans had, as we were saying before, controlled fundamentally these peoples. They had renounced to occupy permanently certain areas, like Germany from, from the Rhine to the Elbe. Um, but the, the military presence along uh, the major rivers in Central Europe was fundamentally aiming at controlling the peoples on both banks. And as we were saying before also, the Roman Empire wasn't quite threatened by these populations up until it began to have problems on its own. This is yet another concept which uh, is valid basically for any other empire you can think of. And say in Europe with the Carolingian Empire, there are other uh, phases that will appear even for the same Roman Empire after the uh, restoration in the 3rd century. Uh, that is to say, these uh, phenomena, especially the, the smaller ones like uh, piracy or raids, etc., are not really the cause of the decline as much as they are a consequence of it. Right? it, it the, uh, about the 3rd century crisis, th there is an enormous historiographical debate that fundamentally for such ancient times nobody really can offer a satisfactory answer. Right? You think that historically we know essentially what were the forces, the dynamics. We, we can't see uh, a lot and we can understand a lot in this regard, but we, we don't have a quantitative dimension. And and yet, um, there is never, but that's what you see empirically, there's never quite a, cr you know, a system that crumbles if, if it doesn't have an internal crisis of some sort, right? And the mistake that is made is, is presuming very often that those who eventually manage to exploit this crisis are somewhat in a better state or, you know, they, they are um, just profiting from it. They're not just pushed by the circumstances, also because they were probably starting to fare uh, worse themselves. Not just they depended on the stability of the Roman Empire themselves, but probably also some other causes that some want, that there's been all the phase of, you know, there were natural disasters, floods, uh, plague, um, all th things, like, things like this that are probably, in fact, overlooked in the, in, in the broader impact that this thing could have. It's like today, right? You, you, can't, you can't say that, I don't know, that the Russian invasion of Ukraine is being caused by COVID, but if you think about how you know, the world suffered from this, how you know, inflation, the, the various policies that were used, that were in turn connected to a kind of moral collapse uh, or a certain, you know, of the masses, etc. It's all interconnected. You cannot really disjoint it. Um, there's not an active principle that out of the blue decides to, to create problems, right? There were intrinsic strength ratios that at some point get destabilized and therefore force the, the players into some kind of um, gamble from which they have to, to benefit to lose, and they, they have made their calculations, they have essentially uh, also accepted that they're going to lose something, in, in, and it's always a moral clash, right, so that the empire, as we've seen, not only survives, but manages to strengthen further for giving stability of another 150 years, um, just considering that it's just uh, the West eventually that has it has it worse and fundamentally dissolves rather than being over overrun right by by an external threat or external force and as always in these big changes what nobody really focuses is on it's not much the invader the external force it's it's the local community what they wanted and what what they accepted as a as a condition. Right, we have made lots of videos about uh, the migration here and the Romano-Germanic uh, world, and I think if you are a regular follower by this point, you know what what the point is. Right, the, the West fundamentally decided to have a Romano-Germanic reality. It was uh, 
surely the product of circumstances, but if there had been some uncompromising um, you know, difference, it could have not set the mechanism, the, the two sides would have not integrated, would have not cooperated, would have not achieved something that eventually went on and also fruitfully uh, produced what essentially what what is most of, of our Western um, civilization narrowly meant. Um, so this is yet another thing, but it does begin now. And we will talk about this perhaps another thing, but there is an idea, a concept that is the one of the Roman and German reciprocal exploitation, right? which is, again, a concept that is that really gets to the core of, of how this was not like an iron, or iron arms per se, but it was more, mostly like kind of a negotiable interaction of some sort. Um, and it definitely happened within the frame of the military development of the empire, right? After the most dramatic decades of the, of the third century crisis, especially from the mid century uh, onwards, the empire was freed in the uh, in the Balkans uh, with this uh, territorial sacrifice of Dacia, north of the Danube, at least because Aurelian created the the one on the right bank, uh, by the uh, from the coalitions of invaders guided by the gods. And when both in the west and the east of the empire uh, raids and Piracies were finally stamped. Um, these aspects are particularly important for, for two reasons. So, actually, for more, let's explain. So, first of all, the gods um, represented here, uh, who were the gods? I, I made videos about the early Germanic identity, what it is that we think uh, these peoples were factually. It's really not easy to tell um, in a concrete fashion. Um, nor we can simply separate them along the uh, the lines. That in fact, the same the same classical historiography made of them. The gods, however, were this broader conglomeration of peoples, mostly of Eastern Germanic origin, uh, and therefore, in that sense, also of part of Celtic. Uh, sometimes in the same Romanized populations, and in some Roman populations, in certain circumstances, Proto-Slavs and Iranians, and even some Turkic element already, because the thing was really that fluid um, ethno uh, genetically um, that moved, or at least coalesced from this. You know, it was a what is considered as a traditionskern, right, and a kind of a original uh, tribal ethnic element that kind of managed to to culturally, um, you know, to convince, right, to, to assimilate, to to um, to adopt, say, all of these other elements that in turn would become kind of, if there was the, such an ethnonym of God, etc. This passed from the, the rising up the Vistula Valley and then uh, shifted towards essentially the, the steps in today's Ukraine. The gods had established a um, a kingdom in the, in fact, in these um, in, in these um, plains that controlled also important uh, coastal, at least you know important rivers. It is not very different from what happened later on with the Varangians uh, in the Rus in um, in the in fact in, in the early Middle Ages in the same areas. And th these peoples left trace. Today we don't talk about that, but you know, up to the 18th century, there was some kind of um, ethnogenetic and even linguistic trace of the Goths in places like Crimea. They were studied by anthropologists. At this point, I think there is not really a real trace, but it, it, there are in Europe here and there, and in the Alps, or in the, some some people still kind of maintained, um, in a kind of a more or less isolated fashion, some of. The, the ancient um, tongues and the ancient, you know, even uh, genozific and phenotypic um, characteristics that uh, of the migration here. They're really living museums in, in a sense, but now things are changing pretty much, uh, unfortunately, from one in, in one sense, um, especially for the historian's interest. But aside from that, um, the um, 
the, the gods had managed, especially the ones that had inhabited the, the most um, f fertile areas in the east, right, in the direction of the rising sun, right, it was all a, a dramatic military and religious ideal there that connected with in, even the incipient spread of Christianity, but the pre-existing Indo-European uh, solar mythology, and it was also drawing a lot from, from Rome, but angels, right, uh, knights, this, um, you know what I'm talking about, again, if you've been following me for a time a while, that made of the gods, especially in, in essentially overlapping to the pre-existing populations, kind of, kind of had lost steam um, in a terms of politically cohesive way, we're talking about the Sarmatians, part also the Scythians, it had been already taken over by by the latter, um, had also conferred kind of an equestrian nature to these peoples, so the gods, especially the, what we call the Ostrogoths, that were not quite existing as such in the East, right, it's mostly a later creation, we, we start having these names really in the 6th century by Roman authors rather than what they were before, but they, um, they were really something, right, they were actually a, a powerful entity, and that of course had its own limits, as you will see now, but had managed to put an important pressure on, uh, you know, quite an extended regional area that was incidentally the one of the Danubian and uh, Pontic, uh, say, Cimmerian uh, frontier of the empire, right? And that was, in fact, the hottest and the area that was most targeted, in a way. Um, why did this happen? Well, again, the the dynamics are difficult to re, uh, you know, to reconstruct per se. Uh, surely these peoples did have some uh, some Scandinavian origin, which is something that has um, been kind of contested historically. And I ag agree even with the criticism of it because much of what we think of Germanicity, right, is was, was not really a Scandinavian thing. It was a continental thing, right? The world Waldenism, etc., was born in what would be today's Central Europe, not really, it passed on to Scandinavia later on, but let's say, given that there is a racialistic bias of people that want to identify today with only with what you look like, essentially what kind of cultural features you have, but m many people think that these peoples had forcibly to come from places like Scandinavia, which was, um, I'd say a historiographical and mythological trope that eventually the Romans kind of um, fabricated, especially for the Goths specifically, um, and that stressed as if, you know, they had just to come from the far north per se. The, the far north was much less militarized than, than the south, This doesn't than, than the continental Europe. This doesn't mean, however, that the the some political nucleus that eventually managed to force its way in, through the southern lands um, in Germany uh, from the north was at the origin of peoples like the gods, etc. If anything, you know, it, it would be suggested by the etymologies, by just even the the few archaeological, the very, very few and very, very vague archaeological uh, hints, because there is actually no evidence, because there is no tag. These peoples looked like all the same, materially speaking, so that you can't quite um, without historic, uh, without documentary sources, you cannot say who was who there, right? That that uh, we know the history of these peoples only when they entered the Roman raider. Outside of that, it's just like a, basically a homogeneous material reality, with yes minor differences here and there, but that absolutely do not overlap political in entities, and especially uh, ones of such fluidity and instability like these ones. So it's fair to say that th these nuclei had catalyzed some sort of, you know, um, force and magnified, or you know, the fantasies of loot and expansion of glory, of warlike populations um, that had emerged from this quite unstable ger and destabilized Germany at that point. That, that's how it began, and that had um, looked at the, the east, if you want, some of the most obvious direction, because in any other, the southeast especially, because in any other direction there were the Romans, in a way, so uh, the gods descend from the Vistula River, they, they, they go around the Carpathians, they, they get in, fundamentally it's today's Ukraine, uh, they reach the Black Sea, yeah, and part of the reason why this may have happened successfully is also that they were mixed with 
and they came to be mixed and to over actually to, to subjugate and to assimilate as we've seen the Sarmatian peoples and other peoples coming from the east that were had not still ended, especially from the Indo European stock, let's say the this constant wave towards the east. Think about the islands, think about the eastern, easternmost, almost quasi central Asian uh, Indo Europeans who were the most warlike, the most primitive that came at waves towards the west, right? And kind of, you know, consolidated providing let's say with more cohesion the populations that had to cope with them so the gods would have been strengthened by that and also um, what was evident to to them is that um, probably the, the the Roman East was was much more easily um, uh, you know targetable right um, first of all because it was you know uh, Rome had surely um, an important military power and important navy and so on. As we'll see, piracy broke out, right? And interestingly enough, the northwestern Germans were the ones who went by sea, uh, mostly. The Goths were kind of a important terrestrial pressure, as we will see properly on the on the Danube. They invaded Greece and all these things. They also made piracy in the Black Sea, in the, in the Aegean, etc. Um, but they, from their pirate nests, they, they knew that they could kind of strike the richest places of the empire, is Greece, Asia Minor, etc. were the, the richest cities, the, the Atlantic ones that had preserved all this kind of more monetary economy, etc. And that were relatively um, softer, right? It was relatively another world, right? The, um, the West, historically, in the Roman Empire, had maintained kind of a stronger military uh, cohesion than and than the than the east if, if anything not much because of the populations we inhabited there as we'll see in a while uh, but because of the permanent military that had always seen in kind of the german frontier and also in the troubled britain kind of the the areas that especially for protecting gold it was kind of a, a huge um, roman reserve um, of of resources and manpower etc um had historically been concentrated there. I mean, the, the majority of the legions in, by concentrations were on the Rhine, right? So facing those would have not been particularly, you know, um, uh, you know, convenient, at least in, in certain instances, more than it was to expand in the East and kind of, you know, bringing other people under uh, in the process. Uh, whereas from the other side, you had just the Romans. So... Um, it was in a way obvious that migration would take that direction. Uh, well, the gods were defeated by Claudius II, in fact, acquired the nickname of Gothicus, the Battle of Naissus, that already shows, by the way, what the Illyrian provinces had, the provinces had uh, become in the, in the meanwhile. We will see it uh, now. And that had aimed at that important area between Central Europe and the Balkans and the Danube and some strongholds that existed there because uh, they were quite, um, you know, quite strategical. They had a properly a military character from which they could, as the Goths would eventually ma migrate in towards later on, have an important kind of um, strategic asset and from there also being relatively close to places like Greece, like Italy, etc. And they were not particularly florid areas. In fact, Dacia, as we were saying before, was um, had been conquered, uh, you know, relatively recently. It was just one century that had been under Roman control. Um, it was a richer area than the average, but probably also mostly because of its mines. It had never had gone as severe, and you know, Romanization was not a particularly developed area in the first place. So the gods began to infiltrate there and to launch these raids and to to put in crisis the uh, the Roman administration and there was ferocious and massive invasions by the way because they were not just the gods right the gods we say in fact we call them the gods that became kind of synecdoche for lots of peoples actually that followed them um, and that just through sheer mass and kind of impossibility also to to control the the very old the the, the length of the very extended uh, what we call limes in a sense, but it's basically the frontier together, that the Romans thought well under Aurelian to give up Dacia. That was this kind of salient, as you know, in, in the 
over the Balkans that had any, you know, w w was important because it, you know, it's basically surrounded by the Carpathians and there were, it was relatively militarized and it could keep in check kind of the peoples of, of Central and Eastern Europe that wanted to try this kind of uh, raids, uh, especially in areas like uh, Moesia, right there, especially the, the, the was the um, the, the only actual rich, I mean, agriculturally pr productive, worth of this name, province uh, all along the Danubian frontier, right? It was the Danubian frontier had always been kind of militarized, somewhat poorly developed from a civil point of view. Mesia was the the only place that the, the Romans had wanted. Also, the, part of the reason why they invaded Dacia is that it was a, a, a rich, fertile area that so also an important degree of Romanization that was just exposed to this Dacian kingdom. There was something more more evolved, more advanced than the other uh, Central European uh, polities. And that was kind of a looming threat for the Romans, full of, of minds, so that we made a video on the on Trajan recently. We talked about also the causes of the, of the Dacian wars in, in the first place. And and the Romans said, "Okay, let's uh, let's give that up because Dacia was not, um, uh, in fact, richer developed enough. It was just a military presence in areas that were becoming ever more poor. Because even though the Romans had controlled the province, all these raids um, between the Carpathians and the Danube, for example, it was kind of corridor where the Sarmatians had ravaged the other." Germanic peoples, or we don't even know sometimes the ethnicities of what they were there, um, had infiltrated. And the same goes from the east, right, between the, the, the Carpathians and the Black Sea, this corridor that had always been from coming from the steppes now and then entering the Danube Valley is, was the, the, the gate for all the nomadic peoples historically in Europe to, to enter and to invade. Um, these regions had been destabilized. The third century had seen, as we've seen, great uh, civil wars between the same Romans. So even regions like Moise, etc., had kind of lost, generally speaking, the frontier in general, what was not immediately kind of Mediterranean and urbanized, heavily urbanized and very fertile. It's important. So at that point, uh, even controlling Dacia had not become particularly important. It was just lots of territory more that you had to control. Uh, it was a salient that in this sense presented you with some advantages from the other side but also disadvantages and that especially in a moment in which you were constantly under attack especially didn't seem to be too convenient so Aurelian retreated he also I made a video about the origins of the Romanian people the question uh, what happened in these times uh, how, why is it that eventually the romance prevailed in areas that eventually had relatively scarce uh, uh, in fact, Latin uh, presence, and that uh, was revived in some years, but th that were somewhat Germanized and later Slavicized. So it's a very complex situation. We're not documented enough, frankly, nor things like uh, genetics can can reveal because we're talking about, you know, even if there is when there is any evidence of of that sort, uh, it's too it's statistically irrelevant. Right, it's historically important per se, but you can't really reconstruct with our means what was there, ethnically speaking, in a clear way. Again, we mostly rely on history at the end of the day, rather than other actual finds from from the places, archaeologically or even genetically. Now, um, the um, this that chapter had been closed. The Danube fundamentally became also in the in in the Balkans the the actual frontier, uh, which made sense and had been, and, and also in the west, uh, the other Germanic um, incursions had been stamped, piracy had been stamped. Inter interestingly enough, the Franks and the Saxons took the sea, which compared to the, their terrestrial pressure that makes you understand probably that was more convenient for them in general um, these peoples were am among some of the most primitive uh, in among the Germanic ones like the northwestern ones were the uh, 
um, the, the kind of even the ones that had, for example, less less uh, equestrian tradition had not a big deal of you know social certification compared to what you see in I don't know around the Elbe with the Swabi and the, where that that had been the center of the main Germanic Confederacy that had that collapsed in the second century and then eventually from there the, these peoples or or others maybe coming from Scandinavia mix etc had shifted towards the east where they became richer and more powerful etc. And the Franks, the Saxons, especially, were rather, uh, rather poor. But they took the sea, and they began to create problems. The Franks, famously enough, at some point entered the Mediterranean, raided, raided here and there. They eventually were were defeated, um, imprisoned, deported, and some could come back, uh, like an Odyssey. Literally, if you look at the the, the path, it had happened. And this other thing of of, of piracy per se is quite eloquent because. Uh, you can't uh, avoid to think of what happened in these times between the Romans and the Germans as what happened between the Carolingians and the Vikings later on. And as I was saying before, especially things like piracy or smaller raids are not a big deal, right? They are just essentially brigands who decide, you know, that there, there is trouble in this big land and there is political... That, let's exploit it at the moment. In fact, and there was a difference, as we were saying, between the, I don't know, the Gothic movement that was kind of more, uh, I can't say quasi statal but it was quite approximate in its aims and so on. But it, it was at least a greater force, right? It was compacting itself probably because of the realization of, of the advantages that from that position, in fact, they, they could achieve. The Franks and the Saxons took just a chance to make piracy. And as soon as the situation was stabilized by the end of the third century, uh, we don't, we don't hear of, of, of that piracy anymore. Uh, you see, piracy is a very good indicator of any crisis situation. I don't know, ever since Pompey had exterminated the pirates, up to literally the 3rd century crisis, we don't have any Roman source talking about pirates, which is quite eloquent, because it's hundreds of years in the ancient world where you don't have effective, coercive means. Um, uh, the Romans could be very, very persuasive in their means, um, also because if you were not persuaded, you were torn and cut to pieces. But, and that's exactly the, the point of deterrence and persuasion um, in that sense. But you got to admit that this stability had been astonishing, right? It, it's very difficult to find anywhere, any time in history, literally the absence of piracy, largely. And not that, you know, we presumably there was, it's just that it didn't, it wasn't any meaningful um, for us, for for historical records up to this time, right? And they and that stops again at the end of the third century crisis, uh, because eventually, you know, the Franks, uh, okay, the Saxons will will move in Britain to Britain, so they had to cross the sea. But the Franks wouldn't basically have much of a, you know, naval adventure. Surely there were Frankish pirates also later on, but let's say that moment of Frankish piracy, it's just fundamentally that historically and then it stops and they they move in other ways when the situation was more advantageous to expand the outland and there weren't just Franks and Saxons were surely Scandinavian or even Gaelic pirates joining so do not confuse in fact this broader uh, uh, say intervention created by by crisis of pirates, mordiers, etc. that could have been just any, like any other pirate or brigand, or brigand with um, with like a, a polity per se, right? Surely it corresponded to some kind of, you know, tribal clanic reality somewhere, but people were very free and, you know, the places like even Scandinavia or Ireland, you know, you could hardly say what was stably political um, reality, but it is important because in the Viking era it happened in the same way, like the first Viking raids were just pretty small and extemporary things, right? They took kind of a a, a relevant uh, consistency when they they the the crisis was the greatest within the Carolingian Empire, and, and only later they began to develop to organize further to become like real armies. There were big coalitions, right? But here it's literally you know some guy that was living I don't know on the Irish Sea coast that heard from the mer local merchants of things were going pretty rough they saw it even in the prices etc they, they heard stories where other people traveled and said you know what there is a mess there Let, let's go see what we can do and it would 
they would just leave with their boats and they would just go there for training and just if it's an opportunity using violence and that's exactly what piracy, piracy is right and that's what I sometimes uh, I, I I get this is but just a, a rant but let's say when when we, we have been obsessed in in the last decades with this or generations with this idea ah uh, uh, I, I hate that my ancestors killed other people who the fuck cares if your ancestors killed other people like I, I found some at that point kind of schizophrenic Scandinavian people who told me something like you know but you know the Vikings were not uh, they didn't just kill they also traded well yeah that's exactly what a pirate does you know wh why do you need to separate the two things right why do you think that there is not a kind of an entrepreneurial or moral character in that right you know of course they were not a pleasant force were basically the peoples who raided were more advanced more kind of civilized and eventually in fact they, they stopped too as soon as they were compacted because it's not that that had a particular following in, in, in the history of civilization but let's say um, you know what's the problem why are you obsessed by you know even needing to draw well, don't, don't, don't to do what the trade is done the main thing that these people traded were slaves and these slaves were fruit of, of the rate so what's the point with well, literally the first thing like the entire thing almost like you could consider a, a 70 percent of the whole thing gravitated around the slave trade um, what's the problem with that Right, the Romans did it too. Like it's not, it, and this is not even the thing of saying, ah, those evil Romans, they had done it more, so it was good to do it. No, that's just bullshit. It's just you know, you being complex. The, the 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 problem is that we're talking, in fact, about the third century A.D. Right, most people had literally to to be explained and to acknowledge that slaves were human beings. They had a completely different value system. They was not just saying. You know, I'm a stupid brute that doesn't understand anything. I think that that a slave is not a human being. No, th there was a, a moral principle behind the idea that certain people deserve to be slaves, uh, or and or to be killed, and others to own them and to kill them. Right. So, and that's what they they believed to the hard core. And again, if you never heard of this. If you don't know anything about those religions, if you think again the the EP bullshit that you know there was some evil people that was kind of more exploitative than the others, that the others were just about nature or metal, this thing you're you're being deluded by a postmodernistic secularistic fairy tale that just reveals the degree of your underschooling, nothing else. Um, so when we talk history, we talk about things seriously, not for people to imagine strange things that we don't even understand why. It, this should be thought. In any case, um, what what we look at with these peoples is a, a, a sort of of, um, of meter of, of how in intense the Roman crisis had been, because there are, there is a very stormy moment. It's just basically thirty years, but they were enough to literally put a, a great pressure on the frontiers. We're already, you know, in trouble, right? The thing I didn't say there is that the same disasters and plague and um, destabilization etc brought to these peoples to move to migrate because again they weren't just pirates etc in central Europe people began to to move right it seemed there was a, a big flood in the Netherlands um, people had to, to go just instinctively towards the places we could just give them food right it's like any big crisis people flee um, so in part there were refugees, in part there were literally peoples in arms, in part there were just war bands who could just alternatively be like martyrs or they could be hired as we will see now by the same Roman army and even making a fortune and uh, or at least a decent income and going back to wherever they, they lived and th there are graves in Denmark of literally of a Roman auxiliary that had been born there, they had served in the Roman army, they came back there and they cared extremely and very much, even though they didn't live in the empire anymore, to be recognized as a Roman auxiliary. That is the kind of mentality and the kind of lack of boundaries that we should be thinking of, literally. Now, um, so the mm, this this thing stops, right? The 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 restitutio orbis, as the Romans called this, the idea that the world, 
the El Kumene, if you were to say it, the, the Hellenic way, had been restored, right? Because the Roman Empire legitimately represented the world entire, and therefore, when order was brought back, uh, these people who had achieved that, great names like, in fact, the Illyrian emperors, Aurelian specifically, had deserved this title of those who had kept the world together. And again, if you look at the broader um, Indo-European mentality, this was behind really any kind of idea. The idea that there were always these forces of evil, of the darkness, that were to, um, to threaten uh, the light, uh, reason, order that the, the empire had embodied. So even uh, it's kind of fascinating what the, the racialistic bias that sometimes this, this takes um, nowadays. Most people don't even think about this, but literally when we think about the Romans send, saying to other peoples that they were barbarians um, and depicting them like um, kind of stupid giants uh, of kind of primitive emotional uh, tamper, etc., that just would get uh, tamed and subjugated, defeated, exterminated, deported, etc. This was the same exact belief that those same peoples had. That is to say, uh, but famously enough, in, in the Germanic, in the Norse uh, mythology, um, what are the giants? Right? What are these kind of, uh, you know, violent forces of nature that the the Asen had brought down under the, the order of the celestial glory and that contrived with the same idea that stood at, at the root of the Roman um, of the Roman sagas and the Roman religion. It, so uh, it, it was a cosmic clash, right? The brute, the barbarian was something that actually even a German who had pretty clear in mind as the anti-hero in his own culture, right? So um, this doesn't take, like, you know, the Romans were a bunch of racists because of that, right? Because they thought other peoples were barbarians. Because the other peoples believed, first of all, the same thing, and secondly, it was something that got down to the core of, of the same person, right? Only the, the hero in all these cultures was the person who could tame his dark force within himself and within the same community, right? So... It's a completely, d and, and they, they, they all believed in the right and the duty, actually, of the, the hero of ruling over all the rest of the world, right? Because only heroes had the right, the privilege, and the duty, and the earned right properly to rule over other people. And again, everybody thought about this. It's the, the hippie bullshit that, I don't know, the Germans were free, uh, and all this thing, and the Romans were the Nazis of the ancient world. It, it's a complete and radical misunderstanding and, you know, display of, of total illiteracy of any kind of historical or religious understanding of those people's mythology and, and core beliefs and value systems. It, it's, it's utterly disgusting. Uh, we have a bunch of, of okay, well, the, the, the level of education today is just, you know, but why do we s send children to school anymore? Because they are done anyway, right? There is no future for them. Uh, at least let's, however, tell them the right things, right? Let's tell them reality not bullshit and a great part of the reason why we have we have come to this point is exactly because people have forgotten any kind of meaning that was the actual the only actual traditional one that these peoples had and that you can read in any single history of religion book worth of this name right so that's already already in principle if you have that in mind you can easily un understand much better the migration era from any standpoint any perspective every people pers point of view than than any other interpretation you could have without um so one has to observe also what what are the changes first of all how did romans cope with this how did they make it well there is um first of all in a more material sense, we can we can see they changed their defensive strategy, right? They had a hell of a military. They knew how to use it, and great part of what we see as the alleged decline of the Roman military in late Roman times, they have made consistent amount of a consistent amount of videos to, to to disprove completely to to the root, and that's another thing that people keep clamorously thinking against any any single historiographical evidence um, is that they began to actually 
carry out a quite uh, capable and sensible uh, reorganization of their army in essentially field armies and reserves, kind of more um, stable, kind of sanitary local armies that would serve this uh, increased need of uh, filling the gaps that were opened by the invasions here and there ever more frequently along the very long especially European frontier. Today we don't talk about the Eastern one, the Sassanid one, the Persian one, because actually that was much worse, like anything that happened in Europe didn't compare with, with what the Romans were coping with, with the Persians. But that's a completely different thing, we'll see it another time, because the Persians were the real threat there, right? Especially after the Sassanids took over, uh, displacing their Sassids. They, um, they had also been heavily Romanized. They had a lot of Roman uh, turncoat advisors and technologies, and uh, combined with their uh, equestrian military tradition coming from the steppes, etc., they you know, they really began to pose, and the properly the reconstruction, the recompaction of Persia around the Achaemenid ideal that was also another that Aryan one. Um, to the, the idea they had to strip um, uh, uh, Rome the, the control of at least the Near East, which is something that already the Parthians had never given up the hope of, but that it had been disastrous at doing, basically losing almost any opportunity uh, they had. But that's, that's a completely different story today. We concentrate on the Germans, right? And this thing of establishing, um, also kind of beginning to fraction the legions, as you know, consisted of more than like 15, uh, 5,500 men. Um, so this bulk, mostly com composed of, um, of heavy infantry originally. Then at this point, as we'll see, there was all the problem of uh, also of finding new records within the empire and uh, being tempted in fact to to hire ever more people of different um, that lived ac um, across the border because the the other side was getting civilized gentrified but not properly uh, was losing uh, force in terms of the middle classes were collapsing because of the economic crisis war etc um, the general temper of the time, the atmosphere was pretty dark. Uh, was uh, the, the empire was quite diverse. We can't talk about a generalized crisis. Even the third century didn't actually see a witness a crisis everywhere in the empire. There were areas that were ravaged, even in the east, by the Goths and other peoples that kept, um, you know, going on as as before fundamentally. Because again, this tells you how what these economies having you see surplus in a in a in a world like that was a big deal in the first place it already meant that you were fatly rich right and these economies otherwise were um, all concentrated on naturally on the agricultural cycles every year famines could str strike if there was a currency or something but uh, um, fundamentally, even the idea of how much wealth was depleted, as, as long as the land kept producing, right, and there was no structural damage or permanent occupation from, from an enemy force, it was, wasn't fundamentally a loss for the empire altogether. The, the point was cracking the moral force, right, the will of resisting, the, the political gain, right. Roman generals were becoming ever more um, private warlords, and kind of operating mostly for their own, uh, for their own prestige and power, and that's the reason why I don't know there was an empire, so-called empire of the gold, that was, for example, not even, uh, it was not even opposite to the rest of the empire. It just wanted to say, look, here we are in gold. We kind of do what we want, including defending the, the Rhine frontier, right? We 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 just want to be autonomous. And the empire had always kind of been something like that. It was different countries put together by what had been originally a central military force that ruled in a sort of, you know, on the other peoples that were in a sort of basalatic condition, even ideologically. Um, and that at this point, while the, the central organisms were, were, or at least the, the ones that had, on, on which the empire had relied on mostly for, for control, were kind of destabilizing, were kind of recovering their own autonomy. 
After all, if you think about it, the Romans defended the empire just with 250,000 men originally. It's, it's not really a lot. Um, it was just uh, these concentration of the Danube and on the, on the Rhine, as we've seen, something in the east and a very few other forces scattered elsewhere. Um, and they had for centuries that basically never met a consistent threat. Like there was no people that had tried to what could the Germans in the early empire, the uh, the, the Parthians in the early empire, it, it was not a threat. The empire had remained there and had kept, you know, uh, vegetating <laughs> like, like like that. Now things were changing quickly. Um, and so the idea, of course, of having s certain troops guarding the borders and more kind of mobile armies that could intervene here and there, this time we're not yet in the Diocletian and Constantinian ref full reform of the, you know, Comitatensis and the Limitani, but there is something like that. The, some legions had remained stationed for literally for, for centuries in some places. They were uh, the, 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 probably the, the entire supply system, the, the, the supply system of these legions was very often connected to the interland of those provinces, especially in gold, where that was imposing. But let's say um, that's probably also why the Danubian frontier was instead somewhat more difficult to control because it was less resourceful per se. But that's an, another consideration. Um, and um, and it worked generally speaking. It worked also because sometimes uh, these um, raiders could not really be stopped. Um, it would be even convenient at some point to let them loot and then um, attacking them after they were burdened by the, the spoils they were carrying home. Uh, there was surely uh, this this idea of defense in depth also has been popularized by Lutwak mostly and uh, people talk about it but the, the, the Roman front like defense had always been in depth usually, right? And uh, there is always kind of a defense in line and in depth in some form, right? The things uh, surely went towards more the direction of concentrating, especially the armories, um, the manufacturers, etc. Mostly in the core Mediterranean lands of the empire they were more easily defensible, they were, you know, there were larger cities with massive city walls. During the third, the, the third uh, century crisis was surely also an in, a, a sort of encastellation period again like after the the Carolingian collapse um, because uh, naturally fortifications were dramatically effective even not just in the Middle Ages right the ancient uh, polyrsetics was uh, basically the same at least in the in the most frequent forms of, of siege warfare um, and um, these uh, had been the main changes. The emperors had had the habit of inhabiting. Uh, also, one 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 reason for shifting the the armories, the the manufacturers, etc., towards the the Mediterranean was the fear of usurpations that, as we've seen with the civil wars, had presented ever more frequently. So the idea is that whoever was the emperor in charge n nominally, if he controlled the whole empire, to, to have at easier disposal troops that could be sent here and there without um, so meeting the the contingental threats and then having some other forces still maintaining control of the boundaries um, guarding it and safe supply uh, uh, logistical chains um, and yet most of these emperors had been creating their own comitatus were often barrack emperors that Lee had uh, emerged themselves as usurpers and that sometimes never even went to rome um and that were they usually didn't have very long lives they were often taken away by their own soldiers the military had uh, become an ever greater force as you know in the imperial making but um, what you see with the third century crisis especially with the Illyrian emperors is that a great part of them just lived on the frontier they had their own court elsewhere during the end of the fourth century it was obvious that Rome was never quite uh, had, had not been the, the main center of, of government uh, in at least as far as this main military threats were concerned and this shows that in spite of all the usurpers cared for the integrity of the empire and um, they um, they just 
they, they were military men themselves and there were episodes of even counterattacks at some point uh, maximin the, the Trajan launched an invasion of germany when he uh, that, that's something the romans had never ab fully abandoned as an idea um but it's not the point the point is that the, the government had shifted towards the periphery cities like uh, trier milan Naissus, nicomedia had um acquired a much greater strategic importance also for whoever controlled them that was not in Rome in Italy uh, and, uh, and so this had created contrast also with the Senate that very often didn't have quite the same understanding or capacity for how to cope with invasions anymore than, than these generals and then that's why they were taking control of the situation also militarily so in all this it's obvious that when you have such um, an intense uh, warfare and this takes place literally at the frontiers on a regular basis the same peoples that are basically just from the other side there is um, an obvious hybrid hybridation of, uh, of military cultures so this is the moment in which the contribution of the Germanic element uh, increased in the recruitment of the Roman army. At this point the Roman army was, um, as we have always said, actually the the Romans had always employed more uh, foreigners than Romans in, in its army since ever. Uh, this is no, there was no exception. The problem as we were hinting at before however is that the possibilities of recruiting troops from within the borders had shrank. I made a video on the Simmacari uh, that since the beginning of the of the third century began to appear as so these kind of allies were friends that were uh, f forces that were not recruited anymore uh, through the mechanism that had occurred in within from within the Roman provinces where not everybody had become a Roman citizen and therefore there was the opportunity of becoming that also through military service and therefore it would recruit these populations that as you can imagine also in the countryside in spite of romanization had not really changed they had remained somewhat warlike or at least even when pacified were rough enough like even the same uh, italic legionnaires that had conquered uh, the empire were coming from quite rough uh, peasant background they, they, that was important also just for you know surviving out there on campaign etc um, but by you know that uh, the Constitution Antoniniana was already there so technically everybody who spoke Latin was accepted as a Roman citizen or better subject given the autocratization of power was taking place and also therefore the that corresponded already to the to the loss of those military traditions in, in among the peoples that had inhabited the lands uh, you know before the Roman invasions and so uh, that now had been again transformed into colonists fundamentally without any particular military um, you know pollution desire um, the 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 italic uh, you know the, during the republic it was mostly the italics that made up the, the roman army then uh, towards the late republic were increasing amount of goals starting from sizzle pine gold that eventually would be annexed to, to italy properly um, some of these were literally descendants from uh, Romans that, that had been settled in those countries as uh, just had they been rewarded with farms and lands etc so these people had married in the local uh, with local women etc but there were also lots of auxiliaries that were signing them and that they were coming from the same places that would eventually earn their citizenship at the end of the service so uh, Cisalpine gold by the, the late Roman times had become literally the, uh, the excuse me the late Republican times had become the uh, literally the strategic center of the empire we controlled that and that's also Augustus and Antony striped or because um, controlling that meant control the most effectively kind of satisfactorily Romanized and, and still kind of more barbarian warlike people then already from the first century AD there were lots of goals properly of transalpine goals in the army and it already Syrians at the time so by the third century um, the, the 
essentially the the italic character of the roman army had been lost right italy had become uh, was becoming there was still a, a consistent middle class but the the third century crisis kind of undermined it like it's, it's but everywhere um but especially in, in the in the west that was somewhat more fr freshly romanized didn't have my, the same paradoxical amount of kind of uh I can't say just urban but just speaking civil tradition like in the east or not area. and the especially the countryside had been had become a latifundium generally speaking these great warlords uh, the senators etc were just owing lots of land uh where all the people who were losing everything because of the wars of the devastations went to work and so the the passage from roman citizenship to medieval serfdom is essentially happening uh like that um and by the third century the actual uh the the only actual uh, areas from which a consistent amount of 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 forces came from internal of the empire to 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 join the army w were the Illyricum and eastern Syria. These were peripheral areas. They had been poorly they were poorly urbanized historically, and they had maintained, in fact, their more warlike uh, character. Um, the um, this man. Uh, you know the Illyrian emperors, as we'll, we'll explain better what what that actually means now, had been uh, had emerged for for this reason in a way. Not just Illyria was say the Illyricum properly meant was um, was on the Danubian frontier, so that was as we've seen the most important one. All these forces would be mostly concentrated, even just to stem the invasions, um, but they were also. Uh, they had developed a very particular attitude towards the empire. The Syrians were present equally, but still, they were obviously mostly concentrated in the east. So when we talk, uh, so we're talking about a hierarchical um, promotion up to the fasts of imperial power. Literally, these emperor soldiers, in fact, as they were called, uh, were mostly coming from in, uh, the Illyricum. Now, when we talk about Illyria in this, in this sense, we don't have to think about much of an ethnic Illyrian reality because the Illyrians historically were those peoples inhabiting the, uh, the Dalmatian coast, uh, the parts of the Interlands as well, um, part of the Balkans, mostly on the Adriatic wa and the Ionian watershed. Right. When we talk about Illyricum here, we're talking an important part of what would be essentially Moesia su Superior. Uh, it would be the lands of today's Serbia. Right. In the south, there was also Dardania. They were in the south mixed with Illyrians. But historically, those lands that were also the ones, as we were saying, were the, the main important. Think about Naissus uh, or Singidunum. We're talking about some niche Belgrade. So you understand, it's basically Serbia. And they had been historically not much, in fact, Illyrian at all. They, they were Celtic. This Kordiski inhabited those lands. They, they were some of the most, some of the toughest peoples that probably the Romans ever met. Like to s subjugate the, this Kordiski, okay, they were not areas that the Romans put uh, an enormous interest in, but let's say lo Roman legions were ambushed, destroyed. They, the Romans took a lot of effort to push them away. Of course, these areas had somewhat mixed. They had also Latinized so much that at the end of, of of this time, late Roman times, an important part of the Balkans spoke fundamentally Romance, right? And, uh, including these lands, right? In fact, even in today's Serbian, etc., it's a Slavic language. You find there is a lot of stuff that is in common, even with Romania, or even properly with the Italic um, reality. Uh, that's a Roman legacy. And these peoples were historically some of the toughest, most warlike and roughest militarized. You know, the, the, these are essentially mon lands of mountaineers, right? Um, in uh, poorly developed situations. Of course, the, the flatlands, the clay areas also along the Danube were kind of more developed. That's where the city main centers had formed. Um, that was the frontier. But these mountaineers from the interland kept filling the Roman ranks because they were rough. They were not even after uh this is typical of the empire that these rougher lands even after hundreds of years uh 
of Roman presence had not quite Romanized, it was normal, right? And so there were lots of, of, of these troops coming from the Illyricum, and, uh, pro and, and these people, uh, also as, as a proof of what I was saying before regarding what really Romans and barbarians thought of each other, uh, had recognized historically the, uh, the supernatural, universal, and um, uh, in incredible nature of the Roman Empire, w w everybody had recognized as the fulfillment, essentially, of the uh, Indo-European uh, uh, tradition at its utmost, that is, the moral force in a religious military fashion having been imposed on the world entire. And everybody was obsessed with this, was, in, was obsessed with the, 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 the glory, the, the invincibility of Rome. And these Illyrian troops began to take that extremely seriously. Right? There are very interesting archaeological finds um, around those areas even today that show, even in, in, in early imperial times, that the local nobility still buried themselves together with chariots. Um, in the in the in the European fashion of glory that you find even in in the same Roman imperial representation of the hero on, on the chariot, like in all the in, in the European tradition, etc. But that you know was not quite literal thing. These peoples, in a sense, given their primitiveness, had even maintained that as a sort not really of lifestyle, because of course the elites were Romanized and civilized. But let's say the peoples re remembered quite. Uh, bloodily those those values and and, and 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 so they 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 understood that that was their moment it was their moment to to take the imperium on themselves right so to re receive this um, enorm uh, enormous task celestial divine task of of recovering the imperium and to ex re-extend it in the world and they actually achieved that right these peoples had a a, a, a sacred deference towards the empire they were fanatically loyal and faithful to, to its idea they were also rough of course they, they were uh kind of uh, of course they were pride about themselves about the fact that they were the single individuals and emperors but the range action of this important militaristic element and lifestyle was essentially at the root also what we see as the, the diocletian and constantinian uh, st uh stato universal order right it was imposed and, and in fact i don't know constantine had as his uh, alter ego in, in in the past spiritually the saint claudius gothicus and the fact that they had defeated the gods again was exactly that uh, um, ideological mystical fulfillment of the of the hero subjugating the barbarian that that is you know that by repristinating the order and establishing the the heavenly in fact, the heavenly system, etc., um, that had been threatened, etc., and and, um, and 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 the Illyrian emperors are to be seen, in my opinion, even morally speaking, in, in this fashion. Because if you understood what they did individually, even as just as figures, like you, 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 taking on yourself all the responsibility, the pressure, the traumas, the violence, uh, the constant, uh, you know, risk. Of, of an entire uh, empire on, on your back. It, it, it's something colossal, right? And norm, people with a normal psyche, we know, can, don't make it, right? We, of course, are completely disabituated to any kind of effort of this kind. These people were fully motivated by it. And they managed to literally restore the empire. Whereas the others, the Italians, other people, had fundamentally... D emptied themselves of that, of that original uh, primal moral force that had brought them at that time to them to hold the imperium. Um, there would be a lot to say regarding to this, and I will make um, another, lots of other videos, hopefully, on the same topic. Because the, the third century crisis is is a defining moment, even ideologically, in the forms of power, in the symbols, um, in the uh, ideologies that that is defeating the barbarian again was the was the greatest thing of all right the this was a a, a, a classical principle since even if you read Virgil etc but that was uh, also what Augustus had done was to restore the threat to, to for, at the end of the civil wars from the within 
right? The, there hadn't been any major barbarian invasion. Here, it se instead, it, se it seemed like the judgment day of the Indo-European religion, the end of times when the wolf wakes up, where the when the Asgard is is assaulted by the forces of evil, when the Asen fall. Th this was a real thing, and so all the meaning there was reawoken uh, suddenly. Also because those are peoples against whom the, 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 the Romans were fighting were, as we've seen, largely believing the same thing. So they also recognized that that force was the universal one. For, as in that religion was the core belief, but just because they had won in the first place. Um, this, this aspect, in my opinion, is never stressed enough. But at the same time, it is, we get to the point of the video, um, the Romans, as we've, we said, recurred with ever greater frequency to elements, uh, to, let's say, originally alien, uh, foreign elements to the empire. And most of these people were drawn from that Germanic world that, after all, as we were also saying before, did not constitute a, you know, a compact and constantly enemy mass because, for for very obvious reasons, because m many tribal uh, autonomous tribal groups were already by themselves uh, by existing, you know, um, uh, landing themselves let's say to Im immediately uh, across the Roman border to function as military clientele and defensive uh, coverage of the empire against the other Germans and barbarians in general. Right? If you are a people that is just living next door, let's say on the Rhine, right? first of all you're more Romanized. Uh, the same, uh, you know, this thing of settling the, the light, as it were called, that is a term that would mean like have been Latin if we take it literally, it was probably either a Germanic name or probably even a, of, of Celtic or even Iranian origins that we don't know unfortunately but they had always been settled there places like Cologne Colonia Agrippina historically those who are being settled with was the Ara Ubiorum the Ubi had been settled there there was Germans who were fanatically proud Romans and that represented one of the, the single most striking uh, successes of Romanization in the history of the empire. Um, that had always been the case. I mean, the Romans had expanded always into areas that were not their own, but they had managed to, after all, convince of the fact that given that the word war conquers, they could share with others this, this thing through the citizenship, to the fact that they could participate, people could participate to the imperium themselves was divine glory. These people had you know what, you know, these people, they are already powerful. We would treat, uh, we would um, be under uh, the threat of annihilation if we stood against them. They bring kind of moral, you know, and material development. Okay, let's take it. It was mostly an elite process, right? Nor the Romans, nor these peoples gave a damn about common people. They, they, they were just oligarchs, uh, more or less degree. But altogether, like, you know, I think even after the end of the Roman Empire in the West, I mean, it was pretty evident which were the er the developed areas with the ones that were not. So there was a benefit after all, and civilization does also pass through massacres and, and, and enslavement, etc. But there is also a civilized way out, and after all, the Romans in the ancient world were some of the few peoples who kind of granted it, it by default with some mechanism, uh, by convenience, but also you know, mutual benefit. So, um, uh, it, it's obvious that if you inhabited just next door to to the, let's say, on the other side of the Rhine or the Danube, of course, you were already basically in contact with the Romans since kind of ever, and you you were already Romanized by a degree. You know that, you know, if you had done something wrong, that the Romans would have just crossed the river and kind of, you know, kind of punished you. So at that point, you know, when other peoples were on the move, you, they, they were pressuring your borders from the other side, and you had Rome from this other. You said, you know what, you know, I, I can can come to an agreement. Maybe I will settle on the other uh, on the other bank, and I will 
offer the Romans to to defend the land, especially given that I see that it's going to populate it around. This is what began to happen, as we've seen during the wars on the, on the borders. These people, t maybe sometimes they even participated to those to those raids. After all, they were uh, it was typical these populations of having kind of a you know a, a shift then or something. But basically, all these other a nobleman or their their youth would join war bands of you know of, of devotees of warrior uh, of animal warriors that would just you know go out there killing raping and whatever uh, just for, by 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 regular uh, habit and some of them would would have been you know fighting against other Germans others would have been fighting against the Romans others would have been hired by some you know, other chieftain or by the Romans themselves. So, after all, yeah, it was a fluid situation. The the problem began to happen also, as we were saying before, because literally some of these peoples didn't literally have even what to eat because maybe their lands had been devastated. Some other people had raided them or there had been, I don't know, some kind of disaster or maybe, I don't know, a famine or whatever. So, they were asking the Romans, look, you have the better land and we see that it's getting depopulated from your side, why wouldn't you let us in? Again, the Romans had always done this. So, part of this was also connected to military needs because the Romans would let them in, not just for a labor force, for uh, working the land, but also naturally for the recruits, and given as we've seen that these peoples were, you know, more warlike by, by, by habit, they, they would make good recruits for the army. And so, this had been the reciprocal exploitation. It's not that they liked each other, as always, nobody liked each other, just like today. It's just that they they understood that, that a deal s could be made in, 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 a, in conditions that were quite precarious, basically, for everybody. So um, they, they all both managed to salvage uh, something of what they wanted in this way. Um, and the... Mm, and in general, this, this was the broader international policy. This is beyond the Roman frontiers as well. Of course, Rome had always had allies uh, from the other side. And, you know, it was these different people's interest to join, to, to, to break the alliance, etc. So, um, the, um, the, there is an important, not just Germanic, infiltration in the Roman army. That at this point is perfectly under control in terms of, uh, you know, military standards within the Roman army. On the other hand, there are literally foreign war bands that are hired in the form of auxilia now, right? And I think it does work pretty well. Like the only a incidents that occurred um, in as long as our Roman army existed historically were basically just in some units in the east after Adrianople when the the Visigoths were you know, basically hired en masse in the Roman army. We're talking about a maximum of 30% of the unit being Gothic. Um, so that that's the worst that literally ever happened. Um, the Federati, as we've seen, and we made another vi uh, video about this recently, were another thing, were literally like foreign entities that were uh, as, as such being settled in the in the Roman territory. And this date back to the imperial link with properly tribal clientels. That's the moment in which Doron said, you know, of course, the, that settlement was not just a few people at a time, as it could happen, as it would happen. Right? After all, the same Adrianople, remember, in the day, was just the Romans basically taking the Visigoths one by one and making them slaves or colonists or whatever. And, uh, and then the Visigoths kind of rebelled and and the mess happened, but it, it was normal, like because these were kind of refugees. Sometimes were people literally with nothing. Right? You can see here in countries with war, and you see how many people flee. They they literally have no place where to go. They're devastated. They're not necessarily a tribal entity. But when these people realize that they are compact enough to to act as one, not just in confederacies, but sometimes you know just tribes, and say, okay, we want to be settled all together, so that we're not just you know, some groups that you will eventually dilute in the empire, but we, we are kind of an entire block of people. Well, this thing will happen kind of later, but since the, the end of the 3rd century, 
you see interesting things happening, quantitatively speaking. We're, um, we're seeing specifically the settlement of colonies of prisoners still. So these were not even now, like they were people who had been defeated by the Romans at the end of the crisis. We're talking principally of Franks and Alamanni. So in the areas that had been more devastated the most, especially in Gaul, right, because there some incursions had happened as well. Uh, but there had also been inter-Roman fighting. So these were literally people who maybe didn't even want, for, for sure, to be deported, to be settled in the Roman Empire. They would have preferred just to loot it and come back home. But they, uh, they were deduced as colonies of peasant soldiers. So the Romans had always been proud of this. It's not that they didn't want just to uh, much like humiliate them if if these people were good at fighting and they were they could be the next uh, the next uh, records in the empire as long as they were under the empire and they were manageable why not right these were people who had fought against the same romans and now they were hired by the romans well after all right in a time like that when you could literally kill people just you know if you wanted especially s slaves um you know, you had even to be thankful you had been offered such an opportunity. Um, and so, by the way, participating to the military protection of the provinces themselves, in a way they were giving them what they wanted. They wanted those lands, you know, where another, they just would come there in a different way. And it's obvious, as you we were saying before, that once they were settled, I don't know, in a place like Gaul, well, the other Franks and Alamanni who wanted to make a raid there in those lands, at that point, would have been seen by these um, colonists as enemies because they had got the, gotten the freaking land those others wouldn't they, they just were trying to or to loot it at least and so there was a good reason for those colonists to defend it from their own uh, you know co-nationals let's call them like this so we are witnessing from the end of the third century to the creation of islands of barbaritas within the Roman Empire. It can be considered legitimately the prelude to much wider settlements uh, and also the future process of stabilization of those um, especially Germanic peoples within the uh, borders of an empire in dissolution. Because literally, this is how they began, right? They first began since the very first centuries of the empire, as in the same ways, as in, in few numbers would be scattered here and there. At the end of the third century, you see that they are settled, maybe sometimes properly in areas that had already gone depopulated, so they, they would even maintain some kind of ethnic cohesion. And even as prisoners, are col as colonists, then something else began to arrive more bands more um, even just as mercenaries sometimes and settled there and then entire tribes and their entire peoples that's that's how it, it happened in areas that of course it didn't happen anywhere in the same way but you know in the west at least would this would take over the entire the entire land basically on, in, within in, in, during the centuries um, so this aspect, I think, is quite important because it's somewhat neglected. We like to stress mostly the dramatic moment after, I don't know, after Adrianople. That was not really that enormous disaster that we think for, from the Roman perspective. Or after 406, you know, when that, that was actually a mess. When the, the, the Rhine was passed, the frozen Rhine was crossed by all those peoples from Central and Eastern Europe. They, they began to roam out Gaul, Spain. It was a mess. Um, but the thing was much older as a dynamic it was already it had already been showed as it, as it could be done that there was that um not much of an opportunity but but a possibility in the first place right to to see those lands as you know to to, to permeate those lands in a way or another so all these peoples were sure, obviously looking for a better land to settle and so you know, what better land than the, I don't know, Roman Gaul, by many standards, especially, well, okay, these, the, what, what is fascinating about this is that, of course, these peoples were mostly settled 
in still in the frontier, right? So in those areas that had gone depopulated the most, that had also decayed the most, where romanization kind of diluted the, the quickest, um, and that were ne literally next door to the empire. So, so even from a Roman perspective, now we think again in 19th century terms, like an empire with a you know with a border, there is a line. Right, even if it is a river, you can identify it as such. But let's say, you know, just settling people there, it's it's like that. That's how far the empire goes, right? And that's okay in a sense. Like it, it doesn't have to be necessarily can be more or less advantageous to to defend an area. Sometimes, but sometimes you just abandon it altogether because it's not really even like in cost benefits ratios. It's not really profitable to do it anymore. See Dacia, see other lands later on, Britain, or even those ones on the Rhine that were, that were left, or that were to, to these peoples in the first place that could stem others, right? So it began consistently by the end of, of, of the 3rd century, and it would remain, in fact, the end of the 3rd century is, I don't know, Adrianople is one century afterwards, so it, it had become a normal thing. Right, was again as we were saying before in the broader world view of the time, like an emperor who managed not only to defeat these peoples, but to and to style themselves with the na their names, etc., as uh, as those who had defeated them, but who could also not just exterminate them, but to deport them and transform them into Roman subjects as colonists or or soldiers. That was the apotheosis of the imperium was literally having a transfiguring capacity on the on the lower element uh, uh, the, the same one that in, in the Indo-European religion transformed the lowest uh, the fear, the, 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 the demonic side of yourself in battle into, into the celestial glory embodied as long as you knew how to tame it right? that was the uh, that's why it was so powerful, for example the, the entire Theodosian propaganda was basically about this right about the fact that the barbarian the ferocious barbarian had been transfigured into uh, a morally uh, you know elevated Roman and this was big right and it was uh, you know think about all the people who lived this life well after all you know they had been uh, those like those Frankish or uh, Alamannic prisoners they they had fought against Rome, they came from tribal backgrounds, were pretty warlike, etc. They wouldn't expect that they were captured by the Romans. They had survived in terrible wars, they had seen their, uh, their, their comrades dying, all these things. And, you know, Rome deported them and settled them in some areas. And, you know, they had a living there. They married maybe with some local woman. They, they, they had a farm, they had an owner. They, they maybe even would continue again to serve. Uh, in, in the uh, in the Roman army and, and their children would because that what was also by the way the the thing especially from Diocletian times where by law people were tied to the profession of their uh, of their fathers that was a big deal as you know and that was um, uh, was specifically designed to even in there maintain an adequate number of people that would have families would always be kind of part of the military wouldn't try they would always be framing that mindset so they wouldn't kind of escape try to desert or some do something else to be more pro important political social engineering that even held for some time right some important time and again this is also part of as Europeans we come from right in in, in the process all right, so for today, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.